Chapter 133, Losing Faith. Summoning America by D.R. Doritos M.D. November 18, 1640. Ragnar, Gra Valka's Empire. Howling winds brushed against the windows of the war room, as if attempting to intimidate the unnerved men inside. Grey skies accompanied these winds, although no rain fell. It was like the weather itself shared the same building tension as the leaders of the Gra Valka's empire, who had just received word of a disastrous defeat at Heitel Base. After a few minutes of waiting and discussing amongst themselves, the meeting's most important men finally entered the room and took their seats. Emperor Gra Luck sat at the head of the table in the war room, flanked by his most trusted advisers. Chief Arnold Kalman, Chief Zan Pastal, and Senator Guinea Marek sat across from him, all wearing rigid faces that obscured their inner troubles. Gra Lux cleared his throat and began to speak. Gentlemen, I have convened this meeting today to discuss the. He paused for a nigh unnoticable moment, deciding his words carefully, set back that our forces were dealt with in the Heitel region. Chief Karlman, he handed off the figurative microphone to him. Karlman summarized the events that occurred in the Battle of Heitel, the first conquest fleet engaged elements from the Marischal Zeroth fleet, which consisted of Marischal warships, mage assets, a saucer, and three plasma dragons. Our forces launched a first strike, deploying submarines as well as hundreds of fighters and bombers with the goal of eliminating high-value targets like their missile battleships and saucer. They succeeded in destroying the enemy saucer, but were unable to sufficiently damage their surface fleet due to the introduction of new types of magic, such as decoys. Due to various reasons, such as inclement weather, our forces struggled to distinguish real targets from fake targets. The enemy has also adapted to our tactics and technology, making use of American advice and equipment to fend off our submarines. After destroying the enemy saucer, our planes returned to resupply, but were unable to completely do so due to an enemy missile strike, which destroyed almost all of our carriers. The enemy followed this up with a coordinated aerial strike using their plasma dragons. Our forces managed to kill one, but the previous missile strike eliminated most of our fighters and thus our forces were forced to retreat. The numbers are still coming in, but we have a rough estimate of the battle's casualties. We lost 16 escort carriers, 6 fleet carriers, 6 battleships, 85 destroyers, 22 cruisers, 13 submarines, and 600 planes. The rest of the fleet reports minor to intermediate levels of damage. The enemy lost 1 saucer, 1 plasma dragon, 30 destroyers, 9 cruisers, 4 battleships, 5 carriers, and 300 planes. Due to the extent of these losses and the threat of counterattacks elsewhere, the enemy has opted not to chase after our fleet, and has instead begun operations to recapture Heitel base. Unsavory murmurs began to spread throughout the war room. The men already knew the details of the battle, but hearing of the defeat once more, by one of their top leaders at that, struck them with another wave of negative emotions. Some reason that it couldn't be helped, they had just encountered a foe and tactics they had never seen before. Others focused on the positive details, such as their successful elimination of two EDI superweapons. However, many among the War Hawks were clearly displeased, despite these considerations. Their displeasure leaked through their expressions, as if they had become bold enough to openly display their disapproval for the Emperor and his supporters. Gentlemen, Gra Luck spoke firmly, calming the room down, I understand that we have been dealt a heavy blow but might I remind you that one setback is not enough to bring the Gra Valka's empire to its knees. We are winning this war handily, and we must stay the course. Remember this, the enemy cannot replace their saucers or dragons. Every loss we inflict upon the enemy brings us one step closer to victory. The room quieted down after hearing Gra Lux's inspiring words. The war hawks kept silent, finding no opportunity to voice their grievances. It was clear that Gra Lux wanted to hear no dissent, based on his tone and word choice. Despite this, one war hawk remained solvent, intent on calling out the emperor for what he believed to be grave mistakes. Senator Guinea Marix, a heavyset man with a prominent chin and leader of the war hawks, stepped forward. I do concur, your excellency, he said, which is why I propose a complete mobilization of all weapons in our arsenal, and expanding our disruption operations against American shipping. This is all-out war, and we must meet these challenges with all the tools at our disposal. Gra Luck scowled at Marix, giving him a violent glare that everyone saw as a sign to stand down. 
Although this was clear to Marix, he chose to meet Gra Lux's glare with his own determined gaze. The two men remained in this standoff for a few moments until Gra Lux finally broke the silence. Gra Lux knew that Marix's faction was gaining popularity throughout the War Department and even the general populace. Carefully trying to avoid granting him more fuel for his movement, he spoke firmly, yet respectfully, I understand your eagerness. Senator, but we cannot afford to make any rash decisions. The military shall continue its angry for deployments, but their warheads will be strictly conventional and their targets strictly military, nothing that should catch the attention of the Americans. The Americans have expressed relative neutrality, it is best that we win this war without forcing their hand and spreading ourselves too thin. Marix was slightly satisfied that the Emperor was following through with the utilization of their ballistic missiles, but they wouldn't be enough to completely turn the tide. A few conventional Angrafer units would do nothing to break Muan anti-air systems and artillery lines, nor could they shatter the enemy's resolve. They needed more. Thus, he pushed for more, I agree, Your Excellency. However, the longer we wait, the harder it will be to break our opponents and the more likely it is that the Americans join the war anyway. Many of our forces, as our generals and admirals can attest to, have encountered stiff resistance due to American weapons. If not through a more aggressive approach, how will we end this war in a timely manner? Marix's words had effectively forced Gra Lux between a rock and a hard place. There was no easy answer, even analyses provided by his top advisors couldn't pinpoint what path Gra Lux should take. Struggling to find a direct answer to Marix's question, Gra Lux resorted to vagueness and deflection, we shall end the war in a timely manner by continuing our current efforts and adapting to the enemy's tactics. As it stands, we are currently making progress on all fronts and have both the Muant and the Marishal scrambling to defend their waters with our numerous counterattacks. The Muans do not have enough naval assets to defend their coastlines, and the Marishals are so afraid of us attacking their home soil that they shy away from the possibility of lending aid to the Muans. Driving the final nail in the coffin, Gralux warned Marix against further criticism, you needn't worry about our ability to win this war, Senator, only your legislative duties. Not wishing to push his luck, Marix simply nodded, of course, your excellency. Gralux then turned his attention to the various leaders of the military asking them for possible counters against Marishal decoys and other magically dependent tactics. While they discussed the impact of decoys on combat and how to improve their target identification systems, Marix could only sit and ponder a different concern, how he would orchestrate a coup. Somewhere in Ragnar. Under cover of dusk, disgruntled men in civilian clothing poured into an abandoned building in Ragnar's industrial sector. It was an old factory, long abandoned after the transference due to a lack of demand for military-grade equipment, perfect for representing the men who now gathered in a dimly lit, smoke-filled room. Men from all walks of life convened here, only under the sparse lighting of the struggling bulbs around the building could one tell that they were generals, admirals, and other high-ranking leaders within the Gra Valka's empire. People continued to funnel in through the decrepit, rusting doors out front until finally, the stream stopped flowing. With the meeting's members now all present, Marix took his seat at the head of a rotting wooden table, his piercing grey eyes scanning the faces of his co-conspirators. Heroes of the Gra Valka's empire, he began, our time has come. Considering the unjustified execution of our countrymen in the Norilshan Strait and the recent defeat at the hands of the Marishals and their ilk, I've come to the conclusion that our current course of inaction is woefully insufficient. The Emperor's weakness is causing our great nation to struggle against mere primitives, and we can no longer afford to debate and persuade. We must take action, and we must take it now, for the sake of our country. The other war hawks in the room nodded in agreement, murmuring their assent. Key among them were Generals Norvan and Krell, as well as Admiral Delano, high-ranking officers who were outclassed only by the three great generals and the chiefs themselves. They oversaw the war's most significant fronts, the Malmond grasslands, the Oster Plains, and the naval campaign in Muan waters. Assassination? Delano suggested, his voice gruff and low. No, wait, he backtracked, that would be too risky. We need a more, subtle approach. Something that won't be seen as outwardly treasonous. General Norvan proposed an answer, what about capturing the emperor? We can use him as leverage to force the other leaders to fall in line with our plans. Marix stroked his chin, deep in thought. Hum, yes. 
that could very well work. The Americans orchestrated a similar coup in Parpaldia, so we know it can be done. However, the reasoning is wholly different. Marek said. As he recalled, Parpaldian leaders launched a coup because their emperor foolishly refused peace with the Americans. On the other hand, he and the war hawks are launching a coup because they do not care about war with the Americans. As ironic as this was, the comparison was completely lost on him as his mind constructed excuses to deny it. General Krell, one of the more cautious officers in the War Department, caught the irony of the suggested coup. The Parpaldians were foolish to fight the Americans because they were outgunned by hundreds of years of technological differences. We're in the same boat, although perhaps not to the same magnitude. What happens when the Americans do decide to invade because of our choices? We all know they are itching to get involved in this war. I hate to say this, but they could crush us like we crushed the Pagandans. Marix waved a dismissive hand, the Americans are too far away to be a real threat. They have no bases with which to support a large-scale assault 20,000 miles away from their homeland. And whatever forces they may send won't be enough, they'll be crushed by the entire might of the Gra Valkan military. We'll conquer Mu, defeat the Mauritials, and then we'll deal with the Americans if we have to. The war hawks continued to debate the merits and details of their plan late into the night, their voices growing more and more fervent with each passing minute. As the meeting progressed, biases and pressure took hold, luring those on edge into the fold. They knew the risks, but they were willing to take them in the name of victory and glory for the Gravalka's empire. Finally, they agreed on a course of action. Marek stood up to deliver his final words on the matter, cementing the start of their operations, we'll begin our propaganda campaigns at once, and ensure that every man, woman, and child in this great empire knows that we are on their side. Slandering the emperor and his supporters will help us gather supporters for our own cause, and when the time is right, we'll strike. We'll seize the emperor and finally steer this great empire in the right direction. The war hawks nodded in agreement, a fierce determination in their eyes. They knew that the road ahead would be long and difficult, but they were ready to sacrifice all in the name of their country. The fate of the Gra Valka's empire hung in the balance, and they blindly believed that they were the only ones who could save it. As the meeting drew to a close, the war hawks dispersed into the night, leaving behind a palpable tension that seemed to linger in the air. Marix was left alone with his thoughts as he walked through the streets of abandoned warehouses and factories, many in a state of awful disrepair. Second thoughts began to assault his psyche, it was as though the shadows were whispering to him, warning him of the impending doom that lay ahead. He tried to shake these doubts as he made his way back home. He was painfully aware of the irony of staging a coup in order to welcome war with the Americans. In the heat of the moment, he had disregarded this, saying that there was no real threat they could pose given their distance from the Western Hemisphere. Did he truly believe this, or was it just an excuse? As he stepped into his home, he passed by a mirror near the front door. The reflection staring back at him was not the confident, powerful leader he envisioned himself to be. Instead, he saw a tired and haggard man, weighed down by the voices of dissent within his mind and the weight of his own ambition. Shaken by what he saw, he narrowed his eyes, determination returning to his tired face. He had already made his decision, and now he had no choice but to double down. 